Thank you, Samitra. So the, the theorem of uh, Paley Wiener uh, was like that. It, it gave, gives us a bijection between two space. And the way I explained was this, if uh, F is entire and uh, exponential type at most sigma, then uh, there is, oh, oh, I forgot one important thing. F restricted to R is in L2 of R. So this set of uh, conditions implies that there is a function which later on we saw that we saw that it's indeed the, uh, the Fourier transform uh, or so instead of there is a G in L2 of minus sigma and sigma such that F of Z is given by this formula. Two pi uh, dz dt. And also there is a, an identity between the norm in on the left side and on the right side. And uh, it's indeed if and only if, it's not something uh, difficult to see the other direction. Uh, the only thing which I forgot is, is this one. Uh, I had to add a two pi here because of two pi, which I added there. Uh, the reason I did not mention this uh, when I prepared the lecture was that uh, in many books, for example, uh, Kusi's book, or even I believe it's in Duran book too, but I'm sure in, in Kutris because I got it there for, for, for the first time. The, the way they define a Fourier transform is not via this formula. They, they don't put two pi over there. They define uh, f hat by integral from minus infinity to infinity, uh, f of t e to the minus i t x dt by this formula. And sometimes uh, they, they add a coefficient here. I put C, some books take C equal to one, some one over two pi, and even some one over root square of two pi for many different reasons. I mean, I don't want to get uh, into the, the way uh, C works here. I mean, many different Cs you see. With this version, you don't need two pi here. So it's uh, exponential type less than or equal to sigma. And then uh, you, have, you have this representation. The penalty is paid somewhere else. I mean, pi is somewhere. You cannot completely hide it there. So that's one thing which is important to, uh, which I wanted to highlight in order to avoid the, the, the mistake I had uh, last time. Now, uh, we <clears throat> start over pretty much last example it's, it's the Bergman space. So example. In the category of uh, analytic function spaces, the previous two, the Hardy space and the Dirichlet space, they were defined on the open unit disk. Bergman space can be also defined on the open unit disk, but it can be even more general. We can see that any uh, G, which is in C, or even later on, you can go to, to Cn. So it's a domain in the, in the complex plane. And uh, uh, the notation either B2 of G, and some, some books even write, write A2 of G, two notations, is uh, the set of function F, defined from G to C. Of course, all analytic means holomorph. And also uh, uh, the integral over G, either you write it G with one integral, but it's, uh, and if you uh, look at the measure I use here, it's indeed a double integral. So it's F of 
z squared d a of z or you can write it like this f of x plus i y squared dx dy is finite so <clears throat> it's a uh, square integrable with respect to area measure in the previous two cases in the Dirichlet and in the Hardy space, we, we started with the line integral. So we, it's uh, obvious that, for example, any polynomial or any function which is holomorphic on a, disk, on a, on a, on a domain bigger than G in the finite case is in the case. So, uh, but uh, from abstract point of view, let, let me prove this theorem. Uh, B2, B2 of G is uh, a reproducing kernel. So it's an RKHS on G. It's made as a Hilbert space. And of course the point evaluations are, are continuous. Uh, to do C, I, uh, to, to do to, to do this, I need an estimation. So uh, suppose uh, this is the point G, and this is the point W. Uh, consider a disk which is here R entirely uh, inside uh, our domain G. So D, our domain can have holes too. So D of W and R, it's even, it's closure, it's inside G. And I want to uh, obtain a representation here on this disk. But from Cauchy, uh, we know that F at point W is equal to one over two pi integral from zero to pi f of w plus r e to the i t or theta d theta for any r uh, between zero and capital r and that, that's the the cauchy the main cauchy integral f of say zeta over zeta minus w d zeta and then when you Parenthrase zeta, you, you obtain this one. That's a line integral. So on this disk, which I, I mean, and enlarge it here, it is W. I consider a small uh, silker of radius R inside the bigger one. But r, little r is free is between zero and r. So I integrate both sides with respect to r dr. So I, I do uh, integral from zero to r, r dr on both sides. Uh, on the left side, f of w doesn't depend on r. This is, uh, and uh, I can write it f r r d r, and on the on the right side, uh, it's integral from zero to pi f o omega plus r e to the i theta d theta, and then the whole thing r d r integral from zero to r. On this disk, that is why I wanted here to be away from the frontier, even the closure is, it does not touch the frontier. So f is, is a bounded function on the, on the disk r, even it's on its closure. And the uh, Fubini or Tanelli theorem, I mean, better to say Fubini theorem works well. And I can interpret this as one integral uh, with respect to the measure r dr d theta.
and one over two pi here. I, here I can write zero to, uh, this is big R. I, I can write from zero to big R, zero to pi, or on the disk, omega radius R. And uh, now <clears throat> on the left side, I have F of R times R2 over two. And if I move capital R to the other side, the representation I was looking for is one over pi R2 integral over the disk f of omega plus r e to the i theta r d r d theta or which is the same thing uh, f of w is one over pi r2 integral over d omega r f of z uh, d a z and uh, for me d a z is d x d y we will see sometimes later on we normalize and it will be different by constant. So uh, for the time being, uh, what, what I obtained is, is fine. And I can draw many consequences uh, after this. First, let's apply cauchy schwartz So W f of w absolute value would be less than or equal to one over pi r2 over integral over disk one times mod of fz daz and then applying cauchy schwartz to this omega r one squared daz root square and the same thing for the function f. And at this point, uh, we obtain a, a, an interesting inequality. Uh, this integral is pi r2, but don't forget the root square. With another one down there, it gives us one over root square of pi r. And for the other integral, let's be generous. We put it integral from g. Instead of this, we write, we write the whole domain, domain g. f of z dx dy root square. And this is the norm that I mean, that in the definition of Bergman space, we had this. I mean, maybe I did not mention explicitly that's that's the definition of norm in the Bergman space. So it's, it's a normal F in D2. So in short, uh, F of W, is less than or equal to one over root pi r norm of f in this space. Consequences of this, this estimation. What is our goal? We want to show that it's a, a, a reproducing kernel Hilbert space. What is in chat? Uh, yeah, Sheldon mentioned G need not to be bounded through, for example, if G is the upper half plane, is still interesting. Uh, indeed, uh, uh, I probably, uh, Sheldon mentioned this, uh, since I mentioned polynomials are there, that was for the bounded case. Yeah, that's absolutely true. And even uh, uh, this inequality that you see here, you see that uh, in some cases, the space is trivial. For example, if G is equal to C, the whole complex plane, capital R here is free, can goes to, to infinity, 
and shows that f is identically equal to zero if r goes to infinity. And therefore, uh, b2 of c is just uh, the trivial case. However, uh, g equal to c plus, the upper half plane is an interesting space and there are uh, other elements, uh, many, many other elements in there. Uh, the reason I, I did not mention that explicitly because my, my focus was on the open unit disk and I did not highlight this case, but Sheldon is absolutely right. So consequences of this. I, I want to show that uh, uh, Bergman space is a Hilbert space and moreover, the point evaluations are continuous. It seems that the last part is done first. However, this is needed to show that it's a Hilbert space. In other words, uh, uh, I, I need this, I need this estimation uh, to show that uh, B2 of G is closed in L2 of G. And when it's closed, it, it's by itself a Hilbert space point evaluation. Oh, why is it like that today? and point evaluation already shown. So how to show that it's closed? Assume that Fn is a Cauchy sequence in B2. Two things, first, Of course, Fn uh, is Cauchy in L2. So there is a function, there is a call it H in L2 <coughs> of G such that Fn goes to, to H in L2 in norm. At this point, there is no indication that uh, H is analytic. And uh, that is the point the previous estimations come into picture. Uh, since Fn goes to H, there is a subsequence, there is Nk, such that Fnk of Z goes to H of Z uh, almost everywhere. So we have kind of pointwise convergence tool for a subsequence, but still it is not enough. <clears throat> to, to show that H is a good function or better to say, change it to a function which is holomorphic, I use this. Uh, as before, consider a, uh, a disk R which does not touch the frontier and so in a certain case, we are in our domain like this. Take a disk like this, can be anywhere, but the, the important thing is that the distance from the disk to the frontier is positive. Delta is strictly positive. And now you can do the previous estimation at any point of this with capital R, with capital R to be delta divided by two. So the radius of this is delta over two. And when you do all of this, still you are uh, away from the frontier. And you can say that for any point uh, W in this disk, uh, F of W is less than or equal to a constant, which depends on Delta, doesn't matter the precise value, it's uh, two over Delta, but the, the precise value is not, is not important uh, for us. The important thing is that it's controlled by the norm of F in this space B2 at, at all points, at, at all points of this disk. 
And uh, now uh, replace f uh, by fn minus fn. Take f to be n minus fn. So fm of w minus fn of w less than or equal to a constant. So uniformly on this disk, we can control uh, the growth of Fn minus Fm. And uh, by our assumption, I mean Fn to be Cauchy, this quantity can be made small. So the right side small implies that the left side is small and therefore uh, if the, the, the sequence Fn is uniformly convergent on this disk, on this disk. So in other words, when you are away from the frontier, uh, the sequence is uniformly convergent and the uniformly convergent sequence of holomorphic function the limit is also holomorphic. So here you can say that there is an F in whole of G such that Fn of Z goes to F of Z locally for, for every point. And uh, more than that, if, uh, I mean, indeed, this is a consequence of the uniform convergence before, but, but this is enough for me. At, even at all points, not almost everywhere. So now compare this one with what we obtained before with this one. On one hand, Fn goes to F everywhere. On the other hand, a subsequence goes to H. So this means that, so this means that H is equal to F almost everywhere. Or we can put it also this way. H can be repaired at a, a set of measure zero to obtain a function which is holomorphic. And therefore, uh, F n goes to F uh, in L2 of G, which is equivalent to say that F n goes to F in B2. Therefore, B2 is a Hilbert space. We already saw the point evaluations are continuous. So, uh, and thus, and our KHs. Uh, a special case, what is this? Special but uh, important case, when G is the, the open unit disk parallel to, to what we saw for uh, Bergman for for uh, for Hardy and the Dirichlet space, they call for the Hardy space. It was a function of the form sum a n z n such that the sum of mod a n squared is finite. For the Dirichlet space we had the factor n plus one in front. For the Bergman space, for the time being, we don't have such a representation. Our definition is that f is in B2 if integral over D f prime z squared DAZ is finite. And for us up to now, uh, DAZ is DX DY. 
I mentioned the, the normalization before, I changed a little bit the definition here. So my definition for, for the disk, I just normalized dA instead of dx dy, I divide it by two pi. So I'll then you f not f prime in that integral. Uh, thank you, thank you. F prime gives us the, another space here. <laughs> f, thank you, yes. Uh, so, so, so the reason uh, I divided by p, you'll see later on, I mean, I add them in parentheses here, that uh, with this, the norm of the constant function one will be one, that is why, no other reason. So uh, with this, the norm of f in the, in the Bergman space, P2, is uh, now integral over d, f of z squared, uh, daz or dx dy divided by pi root of this. Uh, it's, it's the definition of an original one, but it's not uh, similar to, to this one. Can we interpret this or obtain a similar formula based on a n? And this is a simple consequence of uh, Parcival identity, it's not something difficult to, to obtain. Uh, can write it this way. Dx dy is the same as R dr d, d theta. Indeed, we had this before. It's uh, integral from zero to pi, zero to one, f of uh, r e to the i theta squared, R dr d theta cap and I put one over pi here. And uh, now I use the formula uh, for, for f as a series uh, representation. So integral from zero to one, integral from zero to two pi, sum uh, a n, R n that's as our coefficient e to the i n theta squared d theta. And I had one over pi uh, allowed me to write one over two pi. And then uh, the whole thing uh, R dr. And at some point I need to divide, well, multiply by two too. So because of this, I multiply by two too. Uh, the reason I wrote it this way, because the integral uh, inside the, the, the red parentheses, I can apply the parcel identity and it's equal to this sum n from zero to infinity, a n r n squared. And uh, then R dr half. That's that's parcel. And now everything is positive. I have uh, two integral here. One of them is this. The other integral is this summation. Uh, everything is positive. I can change the order. And uh, it's better to, instead of parentheses here, it's better to, to write absolute value because a n could, could be complex number. And, uh, so it's twice sum n from zero to infinity, a n squared, integral from zero to one, r to n plus one dr. And here, a half. And we are almost done. We're almost done because it's uh, uh, the, the, this integral is one over two n plus two and two simplifies and I obtain some a n squared divided by n plus one and root square of this. And now we can compare with what we had before. Uh, one moment, please, uh, what happened? Uh, 
hearings. Uh, so, uh, so you see for Hardy is just a mod squared summation and Dirichlet summation n plus one. And now I can erase this. So the condition for Bergman is equivalent to say that a n squared divided by n plus one is, is finite. And square root of this is, is the norm. Was there a question? Sir, can you please explain the step which uses the parcel identity? The, the parcel identity is, I mean, says that if you have a function phi, even in L2, either L2 of t, if you think of the unit circle, or L2 of, of zero to pi, if you stay on the real line, and then uh, for any n in z, not just uh, in our case, in our case, half of the spectrum is zero. In general cases, for any n is z, phi hat of n is defined by integral uh, with the first interpretation on t, with the second interpretation from zero to two pi of, uh, of not phi hat, of phi, e to the i theta e minus i n theta d theta from zero to pi and then normalize divided by two p. That's the Fourier coefficient. So Fourier coefficient is defined for any integer in, in z and Parswell, uh, it makes the bridge very important. It says that the norm of phi in other original space L2 of t is equal to the norm of phi hat in little L2, L2 of z, which is the same as sum n from minus infinity plus infinity absolute value of phi hat n mod squared and then root squared. That's the, the parcel identity. What I used here, Here is my, this is my function phi, the whole thing here. This is my, my, my function phi. Phi of e to the i theta. And because our little r, everything works well. I mean, it's, we are, we are, uh, everything, the, the, the summation is uniformly convergent. And in this, uh, for this function, phi hat of n is equal to zero if n is negative. That is why I said half of the spectrum is equal to zero. And if n is positive, that's the Fourier coefficient. It's a n r to the n for n bigger than or equal to zero. And what I wrote below here, it's just the mod of phi hat of n, phi, phi hat of n mod squared, what I wrote here. But n from zero to infinity because the other half is identically equal to zero. Is that clear now or more transparent now? Yes, sir. And uh, what you wrote below the parcel identity, uh, yeah. that is just uh, coming uh, from the parcel identity in general Hilbert space, right? You I mean the this, uh, or this the below, uh, the general which one you told for L2 of zero to two yeah. pi. So that's a theorem. That is just a special case of parcel identity for a Hilbert space, right? Uh, uh, for this Hilbert space in, uh, it's, it's a result from harmonic analysis. Yeah. Of course, okay. in, in a general Hilbert space, uh, you also have the, uh, the parcel identity, but uh, 
there is an assumption over there. You will start with a, a family, either a sequence or if it's not countable, a family of function. In the theorem, you assume that it's an orthonormal basis. If so you assume- E raised to power i n theta will be the orthonormal basis for L2 of t, right? Yes, that's, that's the whole point here. In the abstract setting, assuming that uh, your sequence or your family is an orthonormal basis is a, for, is a part of the hypothesis. And then based on that, you obtain the, the partial identity. Uh, in a sense, this is the easy part. Tabs. What is important here, and it's hidden indeed in, in, in the, in the partial identity is that this set, n from minus infinity to, to plus infinity uh, is complete. To show that it's an orthonormal sequence that is simple, but to show that it's complete, it's a bit of work. And then knowing that it's complete, uh, we can obtain the Percival identity. That's the difference between Percival identity for L2 of T and the Percival identity for a general abstract Hilbert space. In other words, well, this theorem has more in it than uh, the one you see for the abstract setting. You yes, see, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, this finishes our uh, example before uh, wrapping up this chapter on examples. Uh, there are uh, very good books now, at least two now, one by Duran and one by Hedeman and uh, Kehe on, uh, on, on Bergman spaces. And also, uh, Sheldon has a very nice paper. Uh, on this computer, unfortunately, I do not have that long paper you wrote many, many years ago on Bergman spaces. If you have, you may share it with us, please. And it, uh, it's a very good reference if you want to be more familiar with these spaces. I will try to find an electronic copy and post it over the break. Thank you very much. Um, the last section on this chapter is when you want to go uh, from C or D, I mean, dimension one uh, to CN or DN. Uh, in some cases, uh, it's very straightforward, but in some other cases, you, you need to be careful. It's not that straightforward. I, I just mentioned the generalization of the definition of H2 of D. And you can follow the same line to obtain the H2 of Bergman and Dirichlet spaces and some others. But uh, as I said, you need to be careful uh, in, in the general setting. How do we define H2 of Dn? First, uh, the definition of Dn uh, D times D, the, the poly disk, and uh, an arbitrary element of Dn or Cn. Still, we can use Z, but Z this time is a vector of dimension n. And uh, how do we define polynomials here? To do so, uh, consider the multi-index i, a1, a2, and n, in which uh, each a k is uh, an integer, is, is bigger than or equal to zero. And now definition, I define z to the power i. So it's a notation, a vector to exponent another vector. This is defined to be the first component 
z1 to the power i1 times the second component to the power second component in i, i2, and up to the last one, multiplied by zn to the power i n. And in this way, I mean, we could have norm, a formal series, formal sum A, which depends on I. I is in Z plus exponent N and Z exponent I. If we are in dimension one, we obtain just what we had before, but in higher dimension, uh, I mean, dimension two or three, uh, the index here is like the one like here. And uh, for example, let me, let me write for the case in equal to two. That's uh, very informative. <clears throat> in the, in the two dimension n equal to two, the formal series sum a i z i, our first term is the constant a zero zero. And then uh, we have terms of uh, degree one plus a one zero z one plus a zero one z two. And then terms of degree two, it's a formal series. We are not worried about conversions now. Uh, a two zero z one exponent two, and here I, ha I have also z two exponent zero, but I don't write it. Plus a one one z one z two plus a zero two z two exponent two. So this is the homogeneous polynomial of degree two, and we continue that. That's our formal uh, power series. Definition of H two of d. And is simple. You know, it's the set of all function f such that sum mod a i square is finite, and the summation summation is over over i. I is in z plus n. In the previous case, which, which I mentioned for n equal to two, when I write sum mod a i squared means that sum of mod of all these coefficients is bounded. So we can show that it's a, it's a Hilbert space of analytic functions on, on the, the n, and even point evaluations are continuous. And I mean, just to, to finish in a few minutes remaining of the first part. Uh, oh. let, me, let me find the, uh, the kernel for, for this space, still in the case two. So in the case n equal to two, I mean, H2, uh, D2, I want to find K, uh, W. In other words, the function K, W such that for any F in H2, uh, F of W is equal to the inner product of F and K, W. What is this? I recall you that in the one dimensional case, it was the uh, Zigo kernel, and sometimes we call it Cauchy Zigo kernel. It's one over one minus Z W bar. But here uh, we have Z one, Z two, W one, W two. What would be the kernel? And to find the kernel, uh, based on this restriction that we put on the definition of, of H2, 
uh, I should clarify what is the inner product, even though it's hidden here. So to be more precise, if F and G are in H2 of Dn, then the inner product of F and G uh, is defined to be the sum AI BI bar summation over all I, where, where AR are the coefficients of F and BI are the coefficients of G. So F has the form sum of AI Z exponent I and G or BI uh, Z to the I. So now we want to, uh, to find uh, KW based on this representation. So we evaluate the right side and the left side, and uh, this identity is the clue to tell us what is the kernel. <clears throat> On one hand, uh, assume that KW also has this representation kw of course bi will depend on, on on i but for the time being we assume that w is fixed and our variable is is z uh, on for f and g what is f and uh, inner product with kw well uh, on one hand we had it about its sum uh, a i b i bar and on the, on the other hand this is equal to f w and we know that f w is equal to the sum uh, over i a i w to the exponent i and by comparing these uh, inequalities together we see that B I bar should be equal to the W bar. Or B I is W bar I. And so K W of Z is the sum, summation over I. B i z i is the summation w bar i z i. According to the definition I, I presented above, <clears throat> if you uh, uh, develop this uh, this sum because it's over all i, at least for example, for n equal to two, it's one plus uh, double. Sorry, I don't know what's going on. one plus w1 bar z1 plus w2 bar z2. This is the, uh, the part for the linear term plus w1 bar squared z1 squared plus w1 bar z1 bar w2, no, or, or, Z2 plus W2 bar squared Z2 squared and continue like this. And you see immediately this is indeed the product of two sums. The first is 
one plus W one, Z one plus W one bar squared, Z one squared. And the other is the same thing with index two. And this is precisely one over one minus W one bar Z one times one over one minus W two bar Z two. So it's a product of uh, one minus W J bar Z J over J from one up to any general case. It's the product of the the Cauchy Jiba kernels that we had before. Uh, so, yeah, all this uh, actually work out because we are working with absolutely convergent series, right? Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, the, the connection apparently is not what I couldn't hear you well. Okay, what I'm saying, uh, like uh, in the third step, you had written the sum as the product of two series. Yes. All this works out because we are working with the absolutely convergent series, right? Yes, yes. Everything is inside the disk. I mean, yes. the way the way I write, for example, here or here or here, even the order of summation is not important. Yeah, and uh, just one more thing. For the KWZ to be the summation I, omega bar I, Z I, yes. this... Uh, uh, summation of mod omega scale mod, mod omega i scale should be finite yes and okay. uh, that is because we are inside the disk yes this, for, this, for, yes for a w fixed and z fixed inside the disk it's absolutely convergent and if both of them are uh, strictly less than or equal to say the r which is less than one then the convergence is uniform on that compact set. Yeah, thank you. So, yeah, the convergence, I mean, it's the best type of convergence that we, we can have here because we stay inside the disk. Uh, in when these parameters are on the boundary, indeed it happens in some studies of the Dirichlet space in which, uh, or model spaces, we have K, W, and Z, uh, absolute value of W less than one, and absolute value of Z less than one. In, uh, in some studies, it happens in model spaces, and also happens in local Dirichlet spaces, at least. Uh, we need to consider point on the boundary. Still, there is a meaning for that, but the calculations are not as straightforward as I explained here. Some caution is needed precisely because of what you said. We do not have uniform or absolute convergence at the point of the boundary, but still we have some type, some type of convergence and we can proceed and define KW. Okay. Yes, sir. Thank you. I think I know it better for this time. Ah, I went a bit ahead of time. I think it's better to stop now, have a, have a quick break of about 10 minutes and then come back with, uh, with the rest in the chapter two.